Well, thank you, Tom and Addy, and thank you to IPI. And it's great that all of us can get together. We have just got to get our country moving again. So thank you for coming here today. Last September, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, speaking before the General Assembly, said the world, quote, must do everything to avoid a new Cold War. We are, he said, headed in a very dangerous direction. And the Secretary General's solution was multilateral cooperation. Now, we can, of course, cooperate with a China that is a competitor. After all, all nations, to some degree, compete. Competition. Remember, this is the result of our Westphalian international order, which recognizes the sovereignty of states that cooperate and compete as they see fit. So the question is, should we, or maybe more to the point, can we, can we cooperate with a China that increasingly looks like an adversary and an enemy? And for the answer, we go back to Guterres. Guterres was marking the 75th anniversary of the UN, and it was a rather somber event because multilateralism, the core ideology of the UN, is failing. And we can see this because countries are bypassing that organization as they know it cannot provide security. The same thing happened in the 1930s when countries realized that the UN's predecessor, the League of Nations, was ineffective. Countries then realized, and they came to know, that they could not, in a multilateral setting, work with the aggressors of that day. Imperial Japan, fascist Italy, Nazi Germany. So the question is, why are we talking about the 1930s? Jim Holmes at the Naval War College recently told me that this moment in time reminds him of 1937. 1937 was a year in which if you lived in Europe or America, you just could sense the danger. If you were living in Asia in 1937, you were even more worried because that year saw the second Japanese invasion of China in that decade. Yet, wherever you lived, you could not be sure that the worst would happen, that great armies and navies would clash around the world, because you still had hope that the situation could be managed. Well, as we now know, the worst did happen. In fact, what happened is far worse than anyone at the time imagined. And we are now back at the 1930s, thanks to China, and we start the discussion of China in Afghanistan. Beijing has long had relations with the Afghan Taliban, both before and after 9-11. After we drove the Taliban from power, and while it was conducting an insurgency, China was actually supplying the Taliban with arms, including anti-aircraft missiles that were used to kill American and NATO forces. And China's support for killing Americans has continued to today. So Indian intelligence was instrumental in December of last year in breaking up an Afghan ring composed of Chinese spies and members of the Haqqani network. And the Trump administration believes that the Chinese members of that ring were, among other things, offering cash to kill Americans. But China has ambitions that go well beyond Afghanistan. China wants to take away our sovereignty and rule the world. And it also wants to rule the near parts of the solar system. And yes, that does sound far-fetched, but no, I'm not exaggerating. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has actually believed that he wants to end the international order. On July 1st, in a ceremony marking the centennial of China's ruling organization, he said this, quote, the Communist Party of China and the Chinese people, with their bravery and their tenacity, solemnly proclaim to the world that the Chinese people are not only good at taking down the old world, but good at building a new one. 
Now, C has been talking about these, what he really means by saying these words is that he wants to impose the imperial era system where Chinese emperors believed that they not only had the mandate of heaven over Tian Xiao or all under heaven, but that heaven compelled them to rule the entire world. Now, Xi Jinping has been using these Tian Xia themes for more than a decade, and so have has his subordinates. So, for instance, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, in September 2017, wrote an article for Study Times, which is the Central Party School's influential newspaper. And in that article, Wang Yi wrote that Xi Jinping thought, and a thought in Communist Party lingo is an important body of ideological work, Wang Yi wrote that Xi Jinping's thought on diplomacy made innovations on and transcended the traditional Western theories of international relations of the past 300 years. Take 2017, subtract 300 years, and you almost get to 1648. So Wang, with his time reference, was referring to the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648, which established the current system of sovereign states. So when Wang Yi writes that Xi Jinping wants to transcend this system, what he's really saying is that Chinese, China's leader wants no sovereign states or only one sovereign state. This means that China is no longer competing with us in the current international system. It doesn't even want to change that system to be more to China's likings. And you hear a lot of policy analysts say, oh, you know, China just wants to make a few changes to the current world. No, China wants to overthrow the international system, which means that Beijing, once again, is ruled by a revolutionary. With regard to the solar system, Chinese officials since about 2018 have been talking about the moon and Mars as sovereign Chinese territory. That's right. They're talking about the moon and Mars as part of the People's Republic of China. And that means that they consider those heavenly bodies to be like the South China Sea, theirs and theirs alone. And it also means that China's rulers actually look at these bodies and will try to exclude us if they get there first and get the capability to do that. And we don't have to speculate about that because Chinese officials have been talking exactly about that. In April, Beijing announced the name of its Mars rover. It told us its rover was named Zhurong after the Chinese god of fire. Yeah. Zhurong is the Chinese god of fire, but he's also the Chinese god of the god of war and the god of the South China Sea. So, now that we know what Chinese leaders want, let's talk about how they expect to get there. And today we'll talk about three of their tactics. Disease, subversion, and nuclear weapons. First, disease. Where did COVID-19 come from? On August 27th, President Biden released an unclassified summary of the report of the intelligence community about the origins of the disease. And the report said, well, there are a number of quote unquote, plausible theories. So for instance, this could have been a natural mutation of a pathogen, or it could have been a leak from a lab, but the intelligence community, those 18 agencies spread throughout the federal government, didn't come to a conclusion as to what was more likely. But even if COVID-19 didn't start out life as a biological weapon, China's leader turned it into one. Most critically, Chinese leaders were telling the world that SARS-CoV-2, the pathogen that causes COVID-19, was not transmissible from human to human when they knew that it was highly contagious. Also, China's leader, while he was locking down Wuhan and surrounding cities, and I know lockdowns are controversial, but by locking down those cities, what Xi Jinping was saying was that, in his own mind, he thought he was doing something effective. So while he was locking down Wuhan and surrounding cities, he was pressuring other countries not to impose travel restrictions and quarantines on arrivals from China. And as we now know, 
It was those arrivals that took a disease that should have been confined to the central part of China and they spread it around the world. 4.9 million people have died outside of China. We don't know what Xi Jinping was thinking, but if after having seen what this pathogen did to cripple China, if he wanted to level the playing field by spreading the disease, the disease elsewhere, he would have done exactly what he did. And this is the first time in history that one nation has attacked all the others. Could China really be that malicious? Well, the Chinese communists have borrowed a concept from the Soviet Union called Comprehensive National Power, CNP, which is a series of metrics that are supposed to rank the relative strength of countries. And of course, China wants to be number one. No problem with that. Now, there are two ways to get to be number one. First thing, you can strengthen your own country. Every country, of course, should do that. The other way is you weaken everybody else. And that's what China did. It weakened everybody else. Okay, this occurred a year ago. So why are we talking about it? Well, we're talking about it because China's working on new pathogens. The 2017 edition of the Science of Military Strategy which is an authoritative publication of China's National Defense University, actually talks about a new type of biological warfare of, quote, specific ethnic genetic attacks. In other words, pathogens that will leave the Chinese immune, but will sicken and kill everybody else. This is China's civilization killer. Now, China denies that it has a doctrine of unrestricted warfare. That's the title of a 1999 book by then two Chinese Air Force colonels. But nonetheless, unrestricted germ warfare is coming our way. Second, Chinese aversion. Beijing has tried to surreptitiously change American political opinion through its troll and other operations. And these operations are actually quite large, dwarfing Russia's, for instance. For example, in June of last year, Twitter took down 174,000 fake Chinese accounts. That's one social media platform, one month, 174,000 accounts. Now, China used its operations last year to mess in our elections, and I guess you can figure out who they were supporting. This year, they were pushing the notion of critical race theory. So China is subverting our society in many ways. Let's talk about another one of them. Last July, the State Department closed China's Houston consulate. And the question is, why would they close Houston? Well, states said, oh, the Chinese are committing espionage in their Houston consulate. Well, we all know that China commits espionage in all of its consulates, including the other four, plus, of course, its enormous embassy staff in Washington, D.C. I think that state closed Houston because China, through its Houston consulate, was providing financial and logistical support to violent protesters in America. A Radio Free Asia report tells us that an intelligence unit of the Chinese military actually based themselves in the Houston consulate, and from there they used big data and artificial intelligence to identify Americans likely to participate in Black Lives Matter and Antifa protests. And then the Chinese military created videos and sent them to Americans via TikTok. Now, this is more than just subversion. This is an act of war. And indeed, there are other suspicious events. So for instance, January of last year, US Customs and Border Protection agents in the International Falls Port of Entry in Minnesota intercept 900,000 counterfeit $1 bills that were made in China. Now, nobody in China's near total surveillance state can counterfeit American currency without the Communist Party knowing about it. So the question is, what is Beijing up to? Now, we know that nobody counterfeits $1 bills for profit. My guess, 
Only a guess. But my guess is that they were trying to support protesters under the radar. But in any event, whatever their motivation is, counterfeiting the currency of another country is considered to be an act of war. In May of last year, Customs and Border Protection intercepted automatic weapons parts in Louisville that came in from China. Third, nuclear weapons. Satellite imagery recently has shown us that China is building 345 missile silos in three separate fields in China, in Gongsu, Xinjiang, and Inner Mongolia. These holes in the ground are seven feet in diameter, which means that they are probably being built to accommodate the DF-41. The DF-41 has a range of 9,300 miles, which means it can hit any portion of the United States. And the DF-41 is configured to include 10 warheads. Now, in the past, China has built decoy silos. So maybe they're just, blind, just trying to uh, play a shell game. Maybe they won't fill all of these holes with missiles. But we've got to be concerned nonetheless. We've got to be concerned because, for instance, Chinese leaders and generals every once in a while feel compelled to threat, unprovoked, unprovoked, they feel threatened to nuke American cities. We also know that China refuses to talk to the United States or any other country about nuclear arms control, so they keep their program secret. And we also have a reason to be concerned because Russia and China could very well work together with their arsenals against the United States and uh, our friends and allies. Well, we know that China coordinates its foreign policy with Moscow, and they also coordinate their military activities. So all of this news suggests that China no longer wants what's called a minimal deterrent. What it's looking for is a war fighting capability with its nukes. And I think what they're trying to do really is to intimidate others into submission. And again, we don't have to speculate because in the last two months, China unprovoked has made threats to nuke cities in Japan and in Australia. Now the hypersonic uh, glide vehicle that China tested in August, uh, Beijing says, oh, this is not a weapon, this was just a reusable spacecraft. Right. Um, this hypersonic glide vehicle that they tested in August is probably another one of their weapons of intimidation. And by the way, hypersonic technology, that was developed in the good old USA. But we've had a series of leaders who thought it was not a good idea for the US to develop these weapons because we thought that we would destabilize the world. We are now 10 years behind the Chinese. That means the Chinese can nuke any city that they want with very little warning. I believe that what we need to do is to withdraw from any treaty that restricts our ability to develop comparable weapons. And by the way, this test of China is in a clear intention to violate the Outer Space Treaty. Why is China making all of these threats and doing all of these things now? I think it's because China is coming apart at the seams. Of course, we've all heard about the Evergrande crisis. This is the debt crisis in China. Evergrande's one company, it owes $305 billion. Uh, we've had now four Chinese companies fail to make bond payments. This is a crisis China can't get past. But it's more than just Evergrande. They've got the rolling power outages, they've got a stagnating economy, worsening food shortages, the deteriorating environment, and of course, continuing COVID-19 epidemics. And we've seen this now, currently, at this very moment, outbreaks in eight Chinese areas, including the capital city of Beijing. And if this weren't enough, China right now is on the edge of the steepest decline in demography in history in the absence of war or disease. Two weeks ago, two Chinese demographers came out with a study which said that in all probability, 
the Chinese population would fall by 50% in 45 years. We are seeing um, projections which suggest that at the end of the century, China will be, who knows, maybe a third of its size today. That happens if you have a total fertility rate of less than one, 2.2 being replacement. And by the way, just a few hours ago, we heard this study that said that 44% of all Chinese women never want to have a child. Well, these developments, all of them, all at the same time, are roiling the political system. And that means Xi Jinping, the leader, is being blamed for a series of policy debacles. You've got to remember that he's got total power, as many people say. That means he's got total accountability, which means he has very few people to blame for these obvious policy mistakes. I think that China's leader probably has in the back of his mind the idea of creating military misadventure abroad to try to corral um, elite unhappiness and popular discontent. In the middle of the 1960s, Mao Zedong, the leader of the People's Republic, actually was sidelined politically. And what he did was he appealed to the Chinese people to rally them against his political opponents in the Chinese capital. That's the Cultural Revolution. Well, Xi Jinping is doing the same thing with his policy of, quote unquote, uh, common prosperity. But there's a difference. In 1966, Mao did not have the capability of lashing out against a neighbor or anyone else in the world in order to rally the Chinese people. Xi Jinping, however, does have the capability to plunge the world into war. Now, Americans look at this dangerous China and we say, how could we have gotten China so wrong? What is going on here? Well, we're generous people. And we had always hoped to integrate China into the international system. And this, of course, was very well brought out by then Deputy Secretary of State Robert Zoellick, who gave a famous speech in 2005 that urged the Chinese to be, quote unquote, responsible stakeholders in the international system. And we thought that if we led by example, the Chinese would follow us. That was a reasonable assumption at the time. But why would we think this way? Well, you know, this was in the wake of the Cold War, and we thought that, uh, you know, victors in the Cold War, that life would be different. Francis Fukuyama, the famous political scientist, actually said, look, this is the end of history. Fukuyama said that events would continue to occur, but that the man, mankind's ideological evolution, that's what he said, mankind's ideological evolution had stopped. And it stopped at free market economies and liberal democracy. So we had reached the end point of ideological evolution. We not only wrote history, we are the victors of the Cold War, we not only wrote history, we abolished history. And as we abolished history, we then made ourselves unable to understand what was going on in China. History hasn't worked out the way we wanted, so what should we do? Well, as Tom talked about, I believe that we need to sever our relations with China. And yes, I know that does sound drastic, but we should cut off the blood supply to those who mean us harm. China's system is unreformable. And because it's unreformable, it remains dangerous to us. China is using every point of contact with our society to overwhelm us, and we don't know how to deal with this. Our FBI is overwhelmed, local law enforcement's overwhelmed, companies, state governments, everybody is being overwhelmed. We need to cut these contacts until we can be sure that we can manage a relationship with China. I've got seven recommendations. First of all, we cut trade. We should not be enriching those who don't like us. And this means we need to get our businesses off of Chinese soil, especially our pharmaceutical businesses. I'm going to go out on a limb in a free market audience and say, I like President Trump's approach 
because in his last year in office, he authorized a $765 million loan to Eastman Kodak to make active pharmaceutical ingredients. Now, the, this was industrial policy, I apologize. Also, the effort misfired, which shows you guys are right. But the point is, one way or another, we need to get our drug companies back in our country because these are products that Americans critically need, and we cannot rely on China for them. So, second thing, we should cut investment into Chinese companies. President Trump did a great thing in his last year in office by prohibiting investment into military-linked Chinese companies. President Biden, to his credit, extended that order, but we need to go further. We need to ban investment into all Chinese companies because all Chinese companies are tied to the Chinese military, whether they're ostensibly civilian or not. China has long held this policy of civil military fusion, which means the military has access to everything that it wants. Third thing that we need to do, we should eject China's agents from our country. To do this, we should close the remaining four consulates. Mike Pompeo did a great thing, he closed Houston. Well, let's get rid of the other four and let's cut back the embassy staff in Washington to next to nothing. We also need to uh, turf out their businesses, including their state banks. I don't know what to say. Next thing, fourth, we should make sure that China does not use its nationals who are on our soil to systematically commit espionage against the United States. This at first, at a minimum, means turfing out their journalists who are known to be Ministry of State Security agents. We must remember that China's 2017 national intelligence law requires every Chinese national and every Chinese organization to commit espionage if Beijing demands, and Beijing often demands. This is our country. We shouldn't be putting up with this. Fifth thing. We should end all technical cooperation agreements with China. We, just stepping back and not even considering COVID-19, we should not be giving China the world's best technology for free. And we certainly shouldn't be teaching Chinese researchers how to manipulate coronaviruses to make them more dangerous to humanity. And at this moment, we still are funding through the National Institutes of Health about seven military-linked institutions in China. And we're doing this on biological research. Sixth thing. We should not allow China to buy our tech companies. I'll pick on the Obama administration here, but all administrations have been failing in this regard. 2013, we allowed them to buy Complete Genomics. Complete Genomics then had the largest or close to the largest collection of DNA profiles of Americans. And the reason why this is important is because China is really interested in biological weapons research. Seventh thing, we should demand reciprocity. China doesn't allow our media into its country. Why do we allow China's into ours? China doesn't allow our apps. So why do we permit TikTok? And also, we can't have a Reagan Institute in China. So why do we allow Confucius Institutes on our college, university, and college campuses? And even more important, why do we permit 500 Confucius classrooms in our secondary school? These are things that seem to me to be pretty simple. But of course, they do require political will. But we are going to have to exercise that political will because our republic is at risk and we must defend it now. We are running out of time. The calendar says 2021, but it sure feels like 1937. Thank you very much.